Mark Pellegrino is an actor who's been in such films as The Big Lebowski and National Treasure, and he's been in roughly a billion TV shows like Supernatural, Quantico, Dexter, Lost, and The Closer. He's also the co-founder of the American Capitalist Society. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Did I uh, did I pick the right shows there? You actually did. Yeah. yeah thank you. You feel good about that <laughs> I list. Feel good you've about got the a resume. long yeah. You've got a long IMDb, and yet we're not going to talk about acting. Thank you all right God. with that? Yeah, I'm I'm more than all right with it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Actors talking about acting. It's uh, that's what we get from actors. Got to be the most boring boring subject matter on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad we're avoiding it. All right. Well, we're going to go deep into into politics and capitalism and free speech. Yikes. A lot of the stuff that I really love. So let's start with that. So as an actor, I find that mm -hmm. many actors are sort of trained not to really say what they think, really share their feelings about things, especially when it comes to politics and, and opinions. Mm. Um, and yet, you're involved with the American Capitalist Party. Yes. Capitalism doesn't seem like the cool thing these days. We're into socialism. Yes, how'd we you, are. How'd you get mixed up in capitalism? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. That uh, that must have just been a twist of fate, um, because I was educated in these uh, state-run schools to believe that capitalism was probably the worst thing to hit civilization uh, since the plague. And uh, but I grew out of that simply by observing, you know, by by uh, observing the the prosperity that it brought so and i see i see in in the uh the, the political w world around us uh a market now for uh, free market ideas cuz what i see in the political spectrum is basically one party with with uh with with two sorts of of expressions you know they both agree on on uh, the premise of of government um, and they disagree on degrees yeah. of that premise, but they, they both agree. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is I don't know that there's ever been a better example of that than we have right now where, assuming that it's Clinton on the Democratic side and we know it's going to be Trump, they're both basically centrist. Sure, Trump says a lot of crazy things and a lot of people don't like things about Hillary, but they're not that different, right? Mm. They've been to weddings together. They've done a lot of money things together. Mm. So that proves it more than anything else that these parties are pretty much in bed together, right? They're in bed together. I think, I think the premise that they both agree on is that uh, it's appropriate to use state aggression to achieve a good. They disagree on what that good is and mm -hmm. on how much state aggression should be applied and in what areas, but they, but they agree that aggression is a good thing. Right. So, okay, so if you don't want the state to be growing, basically, mm -hmm. that's one of the premises. We're, we'll talk about some of the principles in the, in the party. Um, then this is a really nightmarish election, right? Nightmare. Because this whole thing. Even Trump on the Republican side, for someone that wants small government, this is not a small government Republican. I don't know, there aren't many left, I suppose. And certainly Bernie and, and Hillary are not small government people. So that, that's kind of depressing for someone that wants the government out of your life, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't even equate small government with good government. I equate a government that respects individual rights and, and, and holds properties and viable as a good, uh, as, as, as a good government. Because um, a small government can be just as authoritarian as, as a large government sure. if, it's, if its premises are that aggression is appropriate. Mm -hmm. So when did you have your sort of political awakening? You said you, you went to state schools where they taught you capitalism <laughs> was bad, yet it was capitalism that was funding these state schools because it, 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 this was in America, I assume? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when, when did your awakening sort of happen? I think, I think in my um, mid-20s when a, uh, a friend of mine who was in the theater company that I belonged to introduced me to the writings of Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, I would consider myself a, I would have considered myself a leftist. I was a registered Democrat and um, uh, fully on the side of statism without quite understanding what, what that meant. And her writings threw me into a bit of a moral and philosophical tailspin for for years, and it, yeah. it took about a decade for me to resolve all the <laughs> issues that she that she uh, kind of threw in my face and, and made me think about. Yeah, what do you make of, when you just say Ayn Rand, I, I had your own Brooke, who's the president of the Ayn Rand yes. uh, Foundation on just a couple weeks ago. He's a friend of mine. And, and, and a great guy, and I mm. thoroughly enjoyed our back and forth. And I have to say that probably 90% of the reaction we got to it was positive. But the 10% that was, even people that disagreed with the specifics of how the government <coughs> should work or, mm capitalism or you know free will whatever it was 
it was all positive and on point. But the the 10% that disagreed, it wasn't there wasn't a lot based in fact. It was just screaming like Ayn Rand's a horrible, you know, all these awful words and all that kind of stuff. Why do you think that the philosophy of capitalism or objectivism, if we go that you know tightly with it, uh, brings out such emotion in people? I think because. Um it's based on the, uh, the ethics of rational self-interest. And most people have uh, a, a sort of spectrum in their minds when they're thinking of, of values and ethics. And the spectrum is uh, you're either, um, w w and, it, and, this, and the spectrum is informed by altruism, basically. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the umbrella under which everyone sees and defines the good. And uh, to the degree that you are selfish and, and acting for your own interests is the degree that you're parting from the concept of altruism, which is a sacrificial ethics, which says the other should be the beneficiary of values, not you. And right. Rational self-interest is that you should be the beneficiary of the values that you that you go for. So, okay, so there's, there's so much there because that's where people start going crazy. I, it seems obvious to me that if you were to do what is good for you, that doesn't mean you're going to screw everyone else over. If you were gonna do what's good for you in, in your house, well then what you do what's good in your house is probably good for your community. It's probably good for the wider community. Yes, you could do all kinds of awful things at the expense of people, mm -hmm. but, but I think this is the disconnect. People don't understand that by doing good for yourself, in a way, you're actually doing good for many other people, right? Is that sort of the, the crux of it? I think, I think even though that isn't the primary focus, that is the consequence for sure. I think, I think amongst rational people, there is no conflict of interest and there is no clash of rights. Uh, in, in a status kind of world that we live in, then uh, a person going for what they want uh, using state aggression will, will clearly do it by gaining at the expense of somebody else. Yeah. And that's sort of the, the, the alternatives that the, the altruistic mindset gives us. You're either sacrificing yourself to somebody else or sacrificing somebody else to yourself, and rights sort of by nature are meant to clash. And, yeah. and I don't think that's true in a, in a rational world. Right, so we live in this time where everyone's virtue signaling all the time and we know what's going on on college campuses where they're playing this suppression Olympics thing. So in a way, this is really the, this is either the antidote or at least the total reverse of all of that, right? Agreed. As opposed to just pretending <laughs> that you're for, all the, you're for all these groups and then what gets lost in these groups is the individuals, and it's really about the individual, right? It is about the individual. It all comes down to the individual. The individual is the one who thinks, the individual is the one who pursues values. Groups don't. Society doesn't. It's, uh, society and these groups are just composed of individuals pursuing their own ends, and hopefully their rational ends, so they don't come at the expense of somebody else. Yeah, all right, so you started, or co-founded, the American Capitalist Party. Yeah. Uh, what made you say, all right, I'm gonna put my name out there and I'm gonna go for something that's, that's bigger than me and, and try to change things for the better. Well, just, <laughs> just not, not seeing the alternatives out there, you know, and, and, uh, and seeing that the parties ag agreed on an ethical premise and, and, and so that people were, were not really seeing that there, there is an other side, another argument that needs to be brought to the fore. And, and for me, the fundamental question is, um, is as I said, uh, do you want state aggression uh, as a means of achieving the good, or do you think individuals pursuing their own happiness as a moral? Yeah. When idea? you say state aggression, I think some people probably think you mean you just you're talking about war or or. Uh, by uh, coercion through a gun, but it's not necessarily just that, right? It's initiated force against against an individual who's committed no crime. So it 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 covers the spectrum of from from war, um, uh, unjust wars, uh, all, all the way to the regulatory state, which in my mind is is uh, an act of aggression against producers to redistribute capital in the name of justice. Right. Um, and so I feel like the actual alternatives, the, the real alternatives that exist in the political spectrum is statism or liberty. And, and, and if, if you believe that the state is an appropriate means to achieve the good, then you are to a, that degree a statist. And if you believe that individuals pursuing their own happiness is a moral ideal and in no way creates conflict, then you go for something like capitalism. Yeah, isn't the sad part of this that, so I'm obviously on board most of this, and I want to get into classical liberalism in a minute with okay. you. But 
just as you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, when, when we had the primaries, it's like we had those, what I think it started at 17 Republicans. Yeah. The only guy who touched on anything that you just said at all was Rand Paul, who dropped out after it was either the straw poll or the first primary. I mean, that really tells you how sad our politics are, right? It's distressing. It is distressing. But, um, and, and I think that's a result of a, of a, of a couple of things. Um, look, this Trump phenomenon is, is sort of an expression of something healthy on the one hand, in that people are upset. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they understand that political, uh, the PC movement is, is a sort of tyranny and authoritarianism and, and uh, irrational, and they're tired of being uh, under its thumb, and they, they see how it leads to this kind of a, kind of a systemic dishonesty, and, and they're tired of political elitism, and they want their, their, you know, their notions to be reflected in government. They don't want to be ignored, and I think, I think those are very very powerful and, and, and true assessments of the problem out there. The, sure. the, the issue, though, <laughs> with, with Trump, I never thought he'd get this far, to be honest with you. I thought, yep. I thought the American people would be mad <laughs> that expressed that anger, but at some point latch onto a principle and somebody like a Rand Paul, mm -hmm. or even a Cruz, you know, uh, who, who's sort of a constitutional conservative, would, would rise to the top. Your, your reaction right there when you said Cruz, that's yeah. sort of how everybody felt about Cruz. Even the people that liked him on the constitutional stuff, I think everybody was kind of like, just not this guy, could there be somebody else? No, it's that social agenda of conservatism that they, that they have to uh, play to during every election that sort of bugs me. I'm, I'm sorry, it's the, that's their version <laughs> of, yeah. of, of, of the appropriateness of using force against people. Right, wait, let's just unpack that a little bit. So basically, yeah. they would be for all the things that you've talked about. They're for capitalism and supposed smaller government and states' rights and things like that, and yet there's this social component that I think you would be completely against, right? So when they're, yeah. when they're getting the government involved in who you marry and what you smoke in your bedroom and things of that nature, that actually is completely against what their ideology is, but they've coupled that somehow with religion which a libertarian or a classic liberal or uh, a true capitalist, I suppose, would be completely against. Sure, and I don't, and I don't even think they're true representatives of capitalism as well. They're they're just as they've been just as much a party to the fall of the United States into statism as the political left has been, um, and, and have never really been very strong moral advocates of capitalism. Anybody, any pundit I've heard on the right. Uh, at, at best can say there's no shame in the profit motive, but I've never heard them <laughs> just say it's positively good. Right. If business works, yeah. it's actually good because you can hire people and people can buy things and things of that nature. All right. So I know a certain amount of people watching, we're only 10 minutes in or so, are going to say this guy's a conservative. He's a con everything he said is a conservative. Mm -hmm. Now, it's funny, I never email my guests with questions in advance or anything beforehand. I did say to you something about, uh, just a quick one-liner saying something about, it's nice to have an actor uh, with some conservative leanings or something, because actors don't talk about this stuff. And you immediately wrote back and said, well, I'm not a conservative, I'm a classic liberal. Yes. Now, this is a phrase that I've been <laughs> talking a lot about. Nobody really <coughs> understands what it is. It's very close to libertarianism. Um, but why don't you give me your definition of what a classic liberal is? <laughs> I, I think a classic... Well, I'm not testing you. We'll, <laughs> we'll link people to things. Thank God. Yeah. Um, and I think a classic uh, liberal is one that believes that government is a monopoly of force and that force has only one moral uh, expression in society, and, and that is in, in a retaliatory expression. So that uh, I, I, a classical liberal, I think, believes that you should ban the initiation of force from all interpersonal relationships, and that that is the way that, uh, that individual rights are preserved and the inviolability of property is preserved. So that's my take on liberalism. Yeah. I don't know what you're... you're yeah, well, close. I, I would add, I read a great quote by Bertrand Russell, mm. who was saying that, that the classic liberal also will change their opinions as evidence changes. Not necessarily that you're changing your moral compass, but you're willing to change as you learn new information. And we live in a time where people just don't do that. People are afraid to change their opinions because they're called flip-floppers, mm -hmm. or they just get so <coughs> stuck in something that they only, you know, it's like on Twitter, if you only follow people that reinforce your opinion, well, then, then you never change. You're in the echo chamber. Exactly. Well, I think I think it, there needs to be a distinction that's made between principle and dogma. You know, and principles sort of hold for all time. They're like laws of nature. They right. just are, and 
And uh, I, 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 yes, I think liberal, a liberal, especially classic liberal, uh, is, is uh, intellectually flexible for sure. Um, but that just speaks to the fact that liberals uh, are, are rational and they, right. and they hold reason as, as a primary as, as opposed to any other means of, of knowledge. But that, but but let's not let's not push push away the concept of principle and uh, you know and and believe that well if, uh, that that's easily divorceable mm -hmm. you know um, because I, I think those those hold for all time um, and the pragmatists that we see today in politics who shift in constantly that Donald Trump is a perfect example right. of unprincipled pragmatist. That's sort of the opposite. That's an anti-intellectual kind of flexibility. So I think we want that. You know that love of reality and love of reason, and that understanding that a principle is is a is an accumulation of facts. It's it's you know it, it's it's a sort of a, men, a mental shorthand for a lot of information, and and that it holds true for all time. Yeah, so that's really the the catch twenty two with Trump, right? Like we've all been waiting desperately for someone to break through the nonsense, someone mm. to not only be on prompter, someone to actually speak like we speak, someone to not be afraid to share every opinion even if it's gonna upset some people, and yet you just hit on it. The, the, the sort of underpinnings of what he's saying really make no sense. He's saying everything. And yet I've had, I've, Milo Yiannopoulos who I had on, who's a big Trump supporter, said that this election just simply isn't about policy, it's just about this social, it's th about that. It's just about this social component. People are so sick of that that that's purely all they're voting on. But that that's a kind of scary place to be in. It's a scary think. place to be. It is a scary place to be in. And but understandable, as I said, political correctness has is is a, is a tyranny, and we are seeing it in the colleges today. Yeah. How how language is being taken over by this by this movement, and um, and. People just don't want that anymore. Yeah. I wish there were an, a, an intellectual alternative to a guy like Trump, to be honest. I just wish there were. Yeah, I, I, I wish, but we'll have to continue to wish, at least for now. But I, I'm a firm believer that because of all this, by 2020, I think we're probably going to have a viable third party. So you started this party. How, yeah. So how is this different? How is the American Capitalist Party different than the Libertarian Party? Because I, I was reading the platform and the principles and all that. Did you and like it? What did you like it? I did like it a lot. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, it's exactly the stuff that I've yeah. that I've been talking about. Um, and without, cra you know, you're not staking out crazy positions. These all seem very. It seemed based in the reason and logic that I try to apply to things. So I like that. Yeah. Um, but how is that different than the Libertarian Party? Well, speaking of reason and logic, I, I think libertarianism in in the end is about whim worship, sort of the thing that's animating the Trump phenomenon. Um, libertarianism. As far as I can see, the most consistent practitioners of libertarianism don't think that government has an appropriate place in society at all. They consider it a coercive monopoly that will always be a coercive monopoly, um, irrespective of, of whether or not it's constrained by a contract like a constitution. And so they just want to eliminate it entirely and put force on the marketplace you know, the way other you know, goods and services are traded. And uh, capitalism understands, the capitalist party understands that to be a very bad idea. <laughs> right. That force isn't a marketable commodity um, and that it needs to be r deposited in an in, in organization that, um, that is governed by objective uh, laws um, and whose sole purpose is to protect the individual from criminals and from the initiation of force, basically. Yeah. So when people give capitalism <coughs> shit, when they basically are like, it's just not working, and look what's happening in America, or all the, at all the Bernie rallies, and he talks about the 1%, and even though it's really the point one percent I think that he's really talking about, because they talk about the 1%, it sounds like if you make around 400 grand, you're in the 1%. At 400 <laughs> grand, you're not pulling the strings of, of politicians, you're living a nice life, <coughs> sure. Um, but, but so the real problem that people are having with capitalism now I think is the crony capitalism that we have, right? Just the way that bad actors have used the capitalist system. Do you think that's fair to say? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, and I wouldn't call it crony capitalism. I think I think cronyism is a form of statism. It's fascism, and 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 linking it with capitalism sort of puts capitalism in a in a spectrum that it doesn't deserve to be put in. I mean, what we have now and have had for over a century is a mixed economy where there is elements of freedom and elements of controls 
And the elements of freedom, of course, lead to the prosperity that we like, and the elements of control uh, dislocate the market from the, the, the measuring tools that it needs in order to, you know, give us what we want. It dislocates the market from the price, prices and from the profit and, and from the things that enable you know, the resources and capital to be allocated properly and causes these kinds of massive economic problems that we've had over the last century or so since the coming of the Federal Reserve. So uh, I, I don't, I don't like linking businessmen who have political pull with free market people who produce a value that other people want. Right. So you see that more as a political problem, than, a political a, problem. than a problem of capitalism itself. Right. But that shows you how these, this stuff is also intertwined, right? Because if you make a lot of money, then you have access to politicians who can then change laws to then Benefit help you, you rig the system. Yep. So we're in like a, a, real, <laughs> a real mess here, right? So, we are. How, so how do we, at this point, understanding that, I mean... How do we unpin some of that without burning the system down? Because that's what it, to me right now, it seems to me that the Bernie people and the Trump people, that they have one thing in common, which is let's burn down the system. <coughs> and I would say the system, as screwy as it is and unfair as it is, and it needs to get better, but burning it down, I don't think is, is the way to go. Well, I think eventually that is the solution. I think there is no compromise between statism and liberty. It's, it's one or the other. And you see over the last 120 some odd years how the one is slowly taking over the other because, because of the fact that the, the, the political right who's supposed to stand for the free market hasn't um, because they can't, because they've been compromising the entire time yeah. um, with statism. So in the end, the system does have to go. Um, in favor of either one that protects individual rights or one that fully uh, endorses uh, the state's rights to um, to direct the life of the individual. So, uh, but but I, I think it has to be dismantled not in one fell swoop. There's too much dependence on. Right, <laughs> right. That, well, that's what I mean. That when you yeah. just the, they like the idea of burning it down, but I just think when you come out on the other side, we don't know what will happen. So you think there's a way of sort of incrementally getting rid of some of this stuff, some of this regulation. And, and it incrementally came upon us. I think that's the way you have to ease our way out of it. But I, but I think it's, it's up to the uh, intelligentsia and, and the artistic community to embrace a different value set in order to make this palatable to the American people. I mean, uh, if, if you continue thinking that altruism uh, is, is the appropriate moral code, then statism is simply going to be the political extension of that. And if you believe that you have a right to your own life and that the pursuit of your happiness is a moral good, uh, then, then uh, you know, a different system is is what you would you would be for, and that's going to take some time to saturate the culture <laughs> right. with that we, notion. Yeah, we got a lot of work in front of us. We do. I guess is the answer. So you believe that those those moral concepts that those really come from man, right? There isn't a. This has nothing to do with religion or with. Um, I don't know what your personal feelings on religion are. I'm but an atheist. But, okay, you're an atheist. So, uh, so that's also interesting because I've talked. You know, I talk a lot about the political side, and I talk a lot about atheism. Um, there, there's some connection there. What, what, what is that connection? I mean, I didn't know if you were going to tell me you're, you're Christian or you're a believer or whatever. I think it's that been would be irrelevant. I, I think it's been a disastrous thing that capitalism has been linked with Judeo-Christian values, and capitalism has been linked, uh, and and the concept of rights have been linked to an unprovable and knowable God. Yeah. I mean, to me, the concept of right is, is just means a freedom of action and it's observable. It's an, it, you can see in reality why a human being needs to be free from force, <laughs> right. right? You can't think with a gun pointed to your head and you can't act in your own interests or pursue values or create values with a gun pointed to your head. Mm -hmm. So the concept, look, rights wouldn't matter if you were on a desert island. Uh, property wouldn't matter if you were on a desert island by yourself. It's 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 a social moral concept, and it and it comes from our nature. It, it it's it's founded in and uh, and it comes from our our nature as rational beings. And I think linking it to God um, uh, makes it unjustifiable. Yeah. In, in the in the in the eyes of any rational human being out there. Right, and that's where they've also used government. They've <clears throat> been able to link it to God and then made government bigger. So if you're on the right, like I give so much crap to my friends on the left who are controlling language, doing doing all the things that you just laid mm -hmm. out, right? Not, so I'm trying 
to, to bring the left back a little center, I think. But, the, but it's the people on the right who've used God in this equation that have expanded government because, as we said before, they are the ones that want to control who you marry and what you smoke and all that. And that is the reverse of everything else they're supposed to believe in. Uh, agreed. And, and, but the left is the same thing. I remember reading a quote from Theodore Roosevelt who started this disaster of progressivism that he cared about people, not property. And I've had discussions with people on the left who simply do not understand that property and life, the pursuit of your happiness, your body and property are, are intimately intertwined and you can't have one without the other. So that's why the left, I think, thinks it's okay to, uh, to take and redistribute what you've earned to other yeah. people in the name of the good because y y your, your property is something communal, it's, it goes for something greater than you. I your I also, body, on the other hand, is yours. Uh, right, I, I also think a lot of it's just nonsense. I think a lot of them don't practice what they preach. They live for themselves, they try to maximize their own profits. I think a lot of them that own businesses would be happy not to have unions <laughs> or do every other which way to not give their employees $15 an hour. Sure. I mean, I see this with people I know, how they treat people that, they're, you know, that are huge lefties that don't really live up to any of these principles. So that's that virtue signaling thing, like, I'm so good, I'm so good, look how good I am. Sure. But, not, but, but not it's really. unlivable. It's, it's, yeah. not, it's not really a moral premise that can sustain itself or sustain life, you know? It, and I don't, and I don't think it's an appropriate moral code to have to have a standard of value that's outside your ability to achieve and and to define the good um, in such a way that it's impossible to achieve it or impossible to have a good life while achieving it or impossible to have any life while <laughs> achieving it. Right. So how do we get the younger people on board this? Because that's the the part we've touched on it slightly. I mean, the college stuff right now we know is completely out of control mm -hmm. every day, you know what I mean? We see protests, you can protest, but if you're silencing people, now we have a, a free speech problem. And I keep saying, I'm not that concerned at the moment that the government is coming for my free speech, but I am concerned that our, our social contract of letting each other speak, that that's being shredded right now. So what, what do we do in terms of getting some young people on board this? Well, I think, I think these ideas have to start entering the culture you know, and have to start finding some acceptance in the universities themselves. And that's going to take a couple of generations, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <clears throat> in the meantime, I, I think political movements can sort of be the initiator to cultural movements, you know. I think, I think progressivism, uh, even though it was an intellectual movement, uh, it, it was sort of foisted on the American people uh, first. I, I don't think they, they necessarily um, were behind the idea that the state should, should control every aspect of your life, you know, in the early 1900s, sort of at the, the height of, of the capitalist movement. And that, so for me, progressivism came as, as a political movement that sort of saturated the culture, and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. hoping that bringing these capitalist ideas to the fore and presenting them in a way that any rational human being could look at them and say, what problem do I have with this? This makes complete sense, is a way of initiating some cultural change Right. Well. So that really, though, is the is the real damage that these trigger warnings and safe spaces and all that does. Right. That yeah. these kids are just simply they won't even get to hear what you've just laid out or what yeah. some other person might lay out because they could be offended by it or it somehow seems racist because you're not putting everyone on this chart of oppression Olympics. Mm -hmm. So we have to crack that. And I don't know that we have generations to do it. Well, I think also. Um a redefining some political terms will help that as well. A liberalism had a long tradition of intellectual, intellectual strength, yeah. and and it was it was taken over, you know, and it's changed now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think taking back that that label, so that the political left isn't able to progress further as a as a party that's connected to intellectual values, uh, but you know, simply disconnect them from the concept of liberal and, and return liberalism to its, you know, rightful place, which is anyone who believes that the individual has a right to their own life and who adheres to reason and reality can be a political liberal and, and, um, and just let the left and the right kind of 
coalesce and, it, and find their own political Yeah, ground. and most people are there. I, I really believe that most people, I was watching Gary Johnson, I think this weekend on CNN, and was saying that he thinks around 40% of the American electorate, if they really understood this stuff, they'd realize that they pretty much are for smaller government as a rule, that they are for social liberalism and letting people live the way they want, but we get so ca caught up in the craziness and then you throw in a Trump into this situation and we just never have the intellectual discussion about any of mm -hmm. this. So that's sort of where where we fall, right? Like we've got to we've got to keep pushing. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know if politics has always been this way. I, I feel like back in the day that there was some conceptual component to it. Now it's concrete bound, emotion driven, and uh, you can't really get beyond bromides and sound bites, you know, and this is the one arena where there really should be deep discussion because we're talking about social ethics. <laughs> and yeah. These are concepts that are just not so easily fleshed out. Yeah, we don't, we don't have any of it. I mean, really, if you think about, all, think about all the debates on both sides, I think there were a couple debates where on the Democratic side they really had some interesting substantive stuff when they were talking about guns, for example. I think they, were, they had some differences. Bernie explained why he had, he's been more lax on guns than Hillary in a, in a rural state. But pretty much th these debates and almost everything we see in the media is anti-intellectual, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. when, when you turn on cable news, do you ever feel smarter after that? <laughs> that's, I mean, I yeah, watch, I, sure. at this point, I really only watch when I'm doing cardio and I just put it on and I'm t I take my earbuds in and out because I can't even watch yeah. for that long. But I, but I always feel dumber. I always feel I haven't learned anything. And that's, so a lot of this is just media stuff too. Yeah, and that's visual media too. And visual media is more superficial and it, and it, it goes for the bells and whistles and, and you know, the, the headline grabbers and the thing that'll immediately emotionally draw you in as opposed to the more substantive conceptual stuff that I think you and I want to see <laughs> right. when we're watching. So part of this is just the nature of how we get news, right? We're so used to Twitter, we're so used to Vine and, and Snapchat, everything is so short mm -hmm. that to get people, if, if we were to have a real debate, you know, I, every time there's a debate, I say, these aren't debates. A debate is where you challenge someone's ideas directly. These are precision questions that most likely they've been tipped off to beforehand. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really infuriating to watch. Sure. Right? Yeah. yeah, everybody's canned. Everybody has their their rehearsed responses. Uh, nobody's nobody's speaking off the cuff or at least off the cuff intelligently, you know. <laughs> right. And and so we have this sort of canned universe that we're we're watching unfold before our eyes. Where do you think capitalism's working better than it's working right here? Is there a country that you look at and you go, or a system somewhere, or even a microcosm of it in America somewhere, that you go, this, this is how it's supposed to work. And that's what we can use as a little bit of a, a path to get there. Well, ironically, I don't think there's any country on the face of the earth that embraces capitalism fully. But the, uh, even more ironically, the countries that Bernie Sanders talks about are more free than America. They, they, they have more capitalist elements to them than America. And, uh, you know, they certainly confiscate more of their citizens' wealth and redistribute it, but um, there are a lot of ways in, in which it, you can say that those countries are not socialist uh, paradises, but a mixed economy with more elements of freedom than even the United right. States. Wait, so what's the what's the freer part? So when he's talking about some, I think, like, really more like the Scandinavian countries, yeah, I guess, yeah. where they have incredibly high tax. Incredibly high tax, um, but easier to start businesses, you know, and uh, much less certification and licensure, stuff, stuff like that that makes, you know, that makes capitalism rather difficult here, or, or the government creates obstacles here to, to making new businesses are not present there and and so it's not really an accurate thing for him to point that out the point those to those countries as socialist meccas and since since they're just embracing free markets and and a couple of them uh, like Sweden you know had a free market revolution in the in the 19th century mm -hmm. that that carried on into the into the 1960s when the socialists took over so capitalism is such a powerful thing that it can be dead for decades and decades and decades in a country and even ideologically dead and yet still the productivity that was generated from that from that explosion of free markets um, creates wealth still e right. even though it's 
sort of an intellectual dead letter over there. Right. So where does the, the pure capitalist, or, or where does the American Capitalist Party, <laughs> where would you guys fall out on taxes? Because I'm... I guess ultimately because I do believe in equality, because I believe in real equality, I'm pretty much for a flat tax. <coughs> but that, I would also say that you could have some level of progressive tax that would make sense. So that if somebody, I'm not talking about if you make a million dollars, you should be taxed more necessarily. But at some level, maybe over 20 million, we can figure out little percentages, you know, a quarter. You, I think there's some fairness in there, and I know that probably. Uh, a lot, a lot of libertarians would say, no, that's not fair at all. But I, I could do some of that. Is it, do you follow that line of thinking at all? What's your general feeling on taxes? Um, well, first of all, I, I, I think that the graduated tax is, is not really just, for the most part, a person who is earning that kind of money has also created exponentially more wealth than they're actually taking home. So, but a lot of people say they're just hiding that money. They're hiding it. But, but you would argue that they're they buying a big house and uh, they have to have a gardener and a. Well, I would say that if Bill Gates takes home fifty billion dollars, he's created a trillion, two trillion dollars of wealth. Mm -hmm. So, the fairness of of taxing him, you know, more because he has fifty billion dollars, um, sort of loses its its moral luster when you consider that he's created exponentially more wealth that benefits every everybody. Right. To be honest, as with you me. can tell, I wasn't totally sold on what I was saying. <laughs> I just I think there's a there's an argument to be had there, and I haven't quite. Well, I just think I think yeah. people forget that a person has that kind of wealth because they've created exponentially more wealth. So they so they f they forget that they have a, a misperception that you know oh these people are just sitting there they're they're shuffling papers around or they're they're making transactions that are really not benefiting any, anybody. So it's just money accumulating on money and, mm -hmm. and nobody benefits from that, which is it's sort of impossible I think in in the way the economy works uh, today. Even if you just set your money in a in a savings account somewhere, I mean it's it's going to be benefiting other people. Um, in, in innumerable ways, but as far as taxation goes, uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I support a f flat tax um, as a, a sort of intermediary stage to what I think is ideal, and and what I think is ideal is a completely voluntary tax system where um, where you pay a very 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 small amount of your income to support the legitimate functions of government. So if you think about it, you know, if the government now functions at, what is it? What does it function? What does it function at every year now? It's, it's a lot. Trillion, it, yeah, it's something trillion. nutty. Yeah. It's huge. But the actual, the actual proper functioning of a, of, a, of a night watchman type government that just protects your rights is really, really, really infinitesimally small in comparison. So it would be a very, very, very small fractional amount of your income um, in comparison to what we have to give today. But did you say voluntary? Yeah, voluntary. So, so most people are going to hear that. You know, what is he talking about? Who's going to volunteer to give the government money? Well, if you're actually well, well, right now we have an adversarial system that where people sense the injustice of having the fruits of your labor stolen from you and your values subverted and your dreams subverted for the sake of other people, even if they don't want to admit it, they they sense that that's sort of an unjust thing. But if if you're paying the police and the courts and the army to protect you from bad guys, um, it's something that I think most people can wrap their their heads around. And so, uh, what would what would be those core things? So it's police, it's firemen, it's roads. No. No, no, I don't even know the roads. Really? Know. And, ah, well, this goes to fi uh, firemen. Here, we've I, got a little atlas shrugged here, right? <laughs> well, I mean, look. I, I, the, of course, there, there there was a time when you know um, the people were responsible for that themselves, or, or when that burden fell to the states, you know, in a, in a f more federalist system. But I definitely think that the the a civil a civilized society uh, delegates the use of force to a to a body. That is governed by objective law, and so um, and so that is the purpose of government is, is simply to protect you from bad guys, from fraud and force and uh, in, invasions and, and and stuff like that. And and the infrastructure of the country is more or less the responsibility of you and I. And and I think it is in our interest to to build these things. It's uh, or to have somebody build them and to pay them for that. Right. So that goes to where I started, which is that people think that being self-interested is selfish, but usually by being self-interested, you actually are interested in the greater good because you understand that that helps you. Right. I mean, yeah. isn't isn't that <laughs> the the piece of that? Right. You're going to go. I'm self-interested, but I want roads, so I'm going to help 
roads be made? Well, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean, when, when I hear greater good, it's a little scary to me because, <laughs> because pretty much every authoritarian government on the planet that's murdered millions upon millions right, of people have done that. it in the name of the greater good. And uh, you have to reduce that greater good to the individual, and there is no greater good than the individual. And certainly a person pursuing their own uh, values and exchanging with somebody else has to have a reputation if they want to continue to exchange with another person, which means they have to produce and, and, and be a benevolent, reputable member of their their community. Yeah. I, I think there's no more benevolent community than one that says, I don't expect the unearned. Uh, and uh, hopefully you don't as well. We yeah. can exchange as equals with each other. We can trade to mutual benefit, but that's how, that's, uh, that, that is, uh, that's how we maintain a, a non-violent, non-aggressive society. Uh, that's how we avoid conflict with each other. I, I respect you as an individual and your property, your life, as inviolable as mine. So I can't, I, I, I would, by virtue of that ethics alone, you know, not treat you in, in, in a manner that um, would hurt you or violate you or, or, or cause you pain. So I, w I wasn't thinking of asking you this, but as we've come from, that this, is, this comes from man, this, this moral code comes from your mind, so then where in this system, so, something like abortion, now you're protecting the individual, this has all been about the individual. Yeah. So uh, what is in the womb, that child is an individual, and yet you want the government out. So how do you have no regulation when it comes to abortion? Because you want to protect the individual, and yet you want no regulation. There's some level of uh, you know, I, fight I, here. I this get a, a lot one. of crap from my point of view on abortion. Um, Oh, well, no, I'm glad you I'm glad I <laughs> There's going to be a lot of people that, that hate me for, for this, and I've had some Twitter wars with people over it. Um, look, to me, uh, rights are a social moral concept. Um, like I said before, if you're on a desert island, you, know, there's, you, don't, you don't have to worry about the concept of right, because the only person who can stop you from acting or thinking is another person. Right. So, it's, so you do what you got to do. Right. right. And that, so that, that's where rights are applicable. So to me, uh, the, the concept of abortion, the, the woman's, as, a, as an already existing value, already pursuing uh, life, her uh, choice is pretty much all that matters. And until the child is born, when it's now in a social environment, when, when its needs have to be met amongst people, then it has rights. So to say, that, uh, <laughs> to say that rights begin at birth is a controversial thing for people because, you know, they, they change the equation to life. When does life begin? Right. Lots of, lots of things have life and not rights. And, and, uh, and so to, as far as I'm concerned, it's applicable to a separate, individuated being in a social context. Right. I, I guess this is one of the ones where people, you know, everyone wants a purity test. You see this on with every political party mm -hmm. now. It's like the Republicans who want a purity test, which is why they'll talk about these rhinos, Republicans in name only. And you see the Democrats doing this, fighting to be who's the most progressive, because that's the only way you can be a Democrat. It's just silly. And then in something like this, I mean, I would... I would say that at, at seven months, certainly that, that that fetus is a life. So I get what you're saying. You're, you're disconnecting a human, a human a, a being. Human being. Mm -hmm. It is an individual at that point. Yeah, it can't exist without someone helping it and feeding it and everything else. But at seven months, this is a, this is a livable But it's still creature. breathing through the mother. It's still eating but it, through But if the you mother. were to take it out at that moment, yeah. seven months, most likely this... this can live. These are arguable. Yeah. I mean, these are these are the so know, these are the gray moral. areas that are very very interesting to yeah. me. I, I don't think that one should ban the the procedure at that late stage, even though I think nature sort of compels you not to have a, a, an abortion procedure at that stage of things. It makes it extremely difficult and risky for the mother. So nature has the final sort of word on that. But I I, I think bans are, 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 are very risky. And at the same time, I think that forcing people who find abortion morally abhorrent to subsidize abortion or birth control or, or, mm -hmm. or any other process that they find morally repugnant is morally repugnant itself. So, I right. mean, I think pulling federal funding from places like that is the beginning, believe it or not, 
I hate to <laughs> align myself <laughs> with folks that I disagree with on so many other levels, but I think it's the beginning of a a stance on the protection of individual rights. Right, so that's funny. So in this case, you're aligning yourself with people that you probably have no agreement <clears throat> with in so many cases, like basically the Christian conservatives, right? Yeah. But that shows you how muddled our politics are, right? Yeah. That we don't really have clean lines anymore as to what anyone thinks. So you can be, just because you're against government control of all this, suddenly you're aligning yourself with the people that want to control abortion. It's really, it's... Uh... Well, I think in our politics today, it's the authoritarian you like is not an authoritarian. <laughs> but, you know, they, 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 they still think that authoritarianism is good in, in some respects. And <laughs> so unfortunately, you are going to fall on on weird sides of the issues that are as they're currently you know presented yeah so let's just knock down a couple of the controversial topics then <laughs> okay. um, so drug war uh, I'm gonna assume you are completely against the drug war yeah. are you are you absolutely for legalization yeah. of everything completely legalize it and let's just see what happens yeah is that yeah, yeah. that's it yeah Easy. I mean I, I think I think there was a time when when these kinds of drugs that we're probably thinking about um, as, as illicit um, were legal and were, you could buy them over the counter and there wasn't an epidemic that I know of, of, you know, of opiate abuse and cocaine addiction, heroin, uh, there wasn't a, it wasn't a systemic problem. Yeah. And even beyond that, you, you didn't create powerful cartels that have, you know, that can actually determine the way countries are governed yeah. and, and that were, that were pretty much animated by an ethics of violence, you know, and, and you didn't subject people who wanted to procure these things to violence, um, which they are now, and, and because that's when you make something, you make a value that people want and have the ability to purchase uh, a black market item, mm -hmm. you're just subjecting them to an element that is f far more dangerous. And yeah. those people in this law enforcement uh, part of the, of the wor world that you know goes after drug folks, they they could be used in far more uh, efficient ways to keep us safe uh, than putting people in jail and ruining their lives for for just purchasing something that's outlawed. Right, and often they're addicts, which is basically a disease. I think it's classified as a disease. So you're punishing them. I mean, you're and then you're wasting state resources. I mean, it's it's coupled with uh, with a lot of stuff. Uh, so when would it be right? to use state power? Is there any, inst so if we were attacked, let's just say Canada starts lobbing missiles from Toronto into Detroit. Yeah. Um, not it would the, be appropriate to it, retaliate. It would be appropriate. And so to it, retaliate it, to the extent that you end the threat permanently. Not contain it, not uh, marginalize it, and, and keep it somehow thriving, but eliminate it permanently because the the goal of retaliatory force is to protect the innocent. So is this the irony when when I hear all my progressive friends that want us out of these wars yeah. and yet they're also for higher taxes and yet it's our tax money that's funding all this stuff. Wouldn't yeah. you it always seems so obvious to me you would want to starve the government of the money so that every time they want to build a new drone to send to Afghanistan well, maybe uh, there's always money for war, I suppose, but you would want less government money so that they couldn't do all these crazy adventures, right? Well, I think the overwhelming majority of the money that people are, the, the taxes are going to is the maintenance of the welfare state, the regulatory state, and a fraction of it goes to, to, these, to, to our war machine. Um, it's hard to tell where it goes, right, though? Like, it we is. hear all that, and they show us charts, and I'm always like, but there's always money for war. You know, it, <laughs> like, it just is always there. And so. that's unfortunate, because yeah. I think that, you know, there is a, there is an, and of course, it was a huge debate, of course, in the founding of, of, of our country, whether or not a standing army was an appropriate thing for a, for a, a free country to, to have uh, in its wings. Um, but I do think it's an appropriate thing, given our sort of global interconnectedness, um, but not to create wars of democratization and, and to attempt to change cultures, but simply to protect American lives and property and businesses here and overseas. That's it. Yeah. So if you became president tomorrow, mm. knowing that we have these crazy situations, I mean, Iraq actually right now is pretty much worse than it's been at any point in the yeah. last 20 years. We're still in, at war in Afghanistan. I just read that as of two weeks ago, Obama's the longest uh, president in war ever, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you or whoever the American capitalist uh, presidential nominee would be, 
How do you just end that stuff just like that? I mean, do you literally just the day you're in office, you just rip up a lot of treaties and you just get the hell out of there? Um, is, that, is that doable? Is that logical? Does that create a whole other series of problems? Not to sound like a pragmatist, but you know, one would have to actually get in there, you know, roll up their sleeves and see what the extent of the damage is, yeah. I think. But certainly having a, a, um, a principled foreign policy would be a start. I don't think America's had a principled foreign policy for decades and decades yeah. and decades and decades. Uh, certainly not in my lifetime. <coughs> and I've been here 51 years uh, on this rock. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, having a principled foreign policy means uh, understanding that the, the, the purpose of government is to protect uh, you know, individuals uh, from criminals and from, from force and to pursue America's interests, um, period, it, it would be a principle. I think America has indulged itself in sacrificial wars of democratization and, and literally their, their platform has been... Um, uh, and, and I know some folks who fought in the wars, has been uh, literally to sacrifice American lives for the sake of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, these other people and cultures and, and that sacrifice. And oil, don't forget about the oil. Well, well I, I don't know that we gained anything <laughs> from it. I mean, that's even makes it more appropriate to the altruist ethics. I mean, I think the people that said, you know, we, we went in there for oil, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that would have been somewhat a, a healthy, a, a, a healthy uh, motivation in that you know a, a tyrant was going to try to take over you know, in the oil, and the industrial world depends upon that. Uh, it, it, the environmentalists have made it rather impossible for us to kind of sustain our own energy here through fossil fuel use, and it's it sort of made sense to keep the the oil. Uh, uh, flowing and the and the wheels of industry turning uh, to a degree. I mean, I'm I'm really yeah, yeah. I, I don't I, we're, we're I'm not for up in a I'm not <laughs> for the Iraq War, uh, and I'm not saying that. But I'm I'm, I'm that made you sound for war and against <laughs> the environment. It's always I mean I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm saying that that would have been a somewhat legitimate uh, uh, take on things. Unfortunately, it wasn't. It was about You're making a was, philosophical a, argument, which I always try to explain to people is different than making a, right, a right. fully. Pragmatic. Right, it was about nation building, and yeah. we don't need to nation build anybody. We need to just protect American citizens. So, yeah. so, and that that means always reacting, never initiating yeah. force against anyone. Isn't it funny just to wrap up that even as you were saying that, that your subconscious or whatever is back there is going, ah, don't say something that somebody could construe the other way, which then <laughs> goes all the way around to where we started, which is yeah. just this this beast of political correctness, and we've. We've got to crush it. Uh, the hour is gone, which I can't believe. Wow. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, we, that we, was have we have done an hour. So this has been a pleasure, and we will, we will do this again. Yeah. And uh, I hope some of these ideas, I think they're, I don't know, are they trickling up or trickling down, which would be the better way? And they need to do both. They, need, they yeah. just all sorts of trickling everywhere. Yeah. All right, so I want to thank Mark Pellegrino for joining me. You guys can check out the American Capitalist Society at AmericanCapitalistSociety.com.